Hey, Dr. Christensen here. Are chelating medicines safe? You know, at this point, I think most everyone gets that toxic metals are a bad thing. There's a huge number of ways that waste build up inside the body. We've got metals and solvents and pesticides and all kinds of pollutants. And it's critical to get them out to really get your maximal health back again. And there's a lot of great gentle ways to detox. You can do more water, more fiber, more green things. And all that stuff is awesome for taking the wastes that are out that are circulating freely in your body. But there are the wastes that are really stuck. And they're the ones that get in your thyroid, your liver, your brain. And they're the ones that really drive so many symptoms and also the whole disease process. So they only come out when they're bound and chemically changed and they're excreted from the body. And that's what chelation does. There have been concerns raised about chelation and a lot of controversies about that too. And I want to go deep in that and make sense out of that for you all. So the first thing is chelation is used as a testing procedure. And the reason it's used that way is because we want to know what's built up over the course of years and decades. It's easy to do blood tests or just random urine tests for toxins. And that will show what you've been exposed to for the last couple of days. By and large, if you've had recent exposure, all you've got to do is stop it. It's like figure out whatever it is that is coming in and avoiding that particular source. But the real question is, what's built up over long periods of time? You know, not everyone with the same exposure has the same bioaccumulation, but it's the bioaccumulation that drives the whole disease process. So here's the rationale. If blood or urine only show short term, then with challenge testing or provocation testing, you take something that pushes waste out of your body and you see how much waste comes out. The agents themselves will pull waste out from many of the deeper tissues. And that way you can know how much has been lurking behind the scenes and how much is in the background. Now, here's the controversies. There's been a lot of ways in which people have given very different amounts or types or quantities of provocation agents. Now let's think this through. Let's say that someone had a ton of lead in their body, like a lot of it there, and they were given a tiny, tiny little amount of a provocation agent. Because remember, the lead won't come out by itself. So say they were given just a baby dose, just a speck of a provocation agent, and only a speck of lead came out they could be mistakenly thought to not have any kind of a major lead burden. Now, here's another pitfall, and this is actually the second one's more common. Let's say somebody had only a little bit of lead in their system. It really wasn't a big deal. But they got a whopping dose of a provocation agent, and a lot came out, or a moderate amount even came out. Someone could look at that and say, oh, wow, this person has a lot of lead in their body, when they really did not. So there's one more level to this, and this is probably the biggest core issue that's made challenge testing controversial. Remember I said how you could check urine as a screen for recent exposure? Well, we know exactly what normal levels would be like for a big host of toxins in a random urine sample. We know that above some threshold, random amounts of waste in the urine correlate with lots of problems and lots of symptoms. And we know that we expect to see higher levels when there's a provocation given. So are you with me? Now, many laboratories have panels that show levels of waste in the urine. But the pitfall is most of them use reference ranges that are only based on non-provoked samples. So when someone does get a provoked sample done, it looks high even if it's not necessarily high. And many have written about this, some of the quack busters or some of the conventional toxicologists. And rightly, they've called out this problem and argued that people are falsely diagnosed. Someone that may really not have high amounts would look like they had high amounts only because the reference range was not based on a provocation sample. It was based on a random sample. So that's the core issue. But however, it's not a deal breaker. It's really more of a pitfall. The reality is provocation testing is our best available tool to gauge how much wastes are stuck deep in your system. And there's really no debate about that in toxicology. Everyone agrees upon that. It's just a matter of whether or not a standard provocation is done and whether or not a meaningful reference range is used. 
That's all. So it's not unavoidable problems. The next step then, let's say somebody does have a lot of waste that show up. Well then what? You know, you can do steps to, to decrease what's in circulation, but to get at the deep stores, that takes more agents like used in the provocation. That takes chelating medicines. Now, these were first made for people that had ridiculous amounts of exposure in industrial workplaces or on the battlefield from biological weapons. And they were made to work in these most extreme environments. The earlier generation agents, the first one was called British anti-lewisite. Then we had penicillamine, dexferrin, EDTA, DMSA, DMPS. These are now fifth generation chelating agents. And they work. No one debates about that. They grab wastes, they change them chemically so they become water soluble, and you get rid of them, mostly in urine, but a little bit in stool. The word chelate itself is related to the word which forms claw or crab. It's like you're grabbing onto something. So the concern is many are wary of harm from these medications. And there's, there's never a situation in which one should ignore all possible risks. So these are compounds that are pretty powerful tools and pretty specific tools. You know, I think about like a, like a, like a hammer and a, what do you call it, a chisel. You know, if someone is skilled with that, they could make Michelangelo's statue like David, you know. Or someone else who's not skilled could just make a mess with that same stuff. And the same way, these are tools. So they can be used well and gently and appropriately, or they can be used in clumsy fashion. And it's really sad, but there have been some cases of them used in poor fashion. Honestly, no big cases in the recent past, but some in the distant past. And it's given a bad name to really an important process that has no other workarounds. So what can go wrong with these medications? Well, there's two categories of negative outcomes. One category is just the medicine itself. And that's really all around allergy. So a few people per 10,000 can be out and out allergic to these medicines. And in almost all cases, they would know that with their first exposure. And they would have a rash or some swelling or some discomfort. And the appropriate step is to just not do that and not consider that a viable treatment option for them. A smaller group of people could develop an allergy after their second exposure. So even more rare to have it happen later than that. But that's really the main way that these things are inertly toxic by themselves is just the risk of allergy. These compounds are all protein byproducts, so they're not inherently foreign or treated as synthetic. The biggest group of negative reactions is not as much related to them as it is related to the whole detox process. And most of this data comes from those who've been exposed on an industrial scale. And these are cases to where someone was close to being just permanently damaged because of horribly high levels of mercury. And the tough part was all that mercury was stuck in their brain and their spine and it wasn't moving out. So they were given a lot of chelating medications to help and the mercury came out. And on the way, all that mercury then stressed the liver or the kidneys. So there are case reports about hepatotoxicity or renal toxicity, liver or kidneys, but those are isolated to cases where there were ridiculously high amounts of toxins that were liberated. And the net effect was positive, but it was some discomfort along the way for some people. That really doesn't apply to the common amounts of toxins that we have in the more day-to-day -day population. It's more so those severe cases. So the other thing we see is that there's been talk about this idea of redistribution. And I've seen a lot of posts and articles saying that chelation is dangerous because metals can redistribute. And their argument is that you could have toxins that are somewhere, say, in your fat, and you could do a chelating medicine like DMSA or DMPS, and that same stuff would go into your brain. It would redistribute. And well, you know, as as almost always, there's some partial truth there. So metals can redistribute, but they never go from a low concentration to a high concentration. That just doesn't work in nature. So you can't have them come out of somewhere and go into somewhere else where they're already there. But what does happen with redistribution is that some parts of your body detox faster than others. Here's a really good case in point. Lead really builds up inside the bones. 
but it builds up in your tissues also. And over time, those levels, they equalize with each other. So I'm gonna make up some numbers just to illustrate a concept. Let's say you've got 10 parts of lead in your tissues, which mostly like fat and muscle, and then 10 parts of lead in your bones. So when you're testing someone via provocation, you're mostly measuring that tissue level, but they're equalized over long periods of time so you know what's in the rest of the body. So on their test, they've got 10. Well, we treat them and eventually they're at zero, but there's still 10 in the bones, right? So over the course of another three months, those will, the lead will redistribute and it'll move out from the high concentration towards the low concentration. So the zero in the tissues will move up to five and the 10 in the bones will move down to five. So that kind of redistribution does happen, but it's not really a bad thing, it's just how it works. So when someone sees that, if they didn't understand, they could retest and say, oh no, I went from zero to five, it's come back from somewhere. But it didn't, it just redistributed out of the deeper stores into the tissues. That's a good thing. So then if that person treated again, they would go to zero here, and then eventually two and a half, and then like one and a quarter, which is basically none. So that's the one truth about redistribution. But redistribution as far as waste going somewhere important in a higher concentration, that's like a river flowing uphill by itself. It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> Valid concern, but just not a real thing. There's also data about how those who have a fair amount of detox may lose some good minerals. And this is really well studied. It's more of a problem for the older medicines, which are really no longer even in use anymore. So the newest ones, the data is mixed. Some data suggests that there's almost no minerals lost from detox. Some older data says there may be some, and it really comes down to zinc, manganese, selenium, and copper. So the amounts we're talking about, it's really about a few dozen micrograms for selenium, and then maybe a fraction of a milligram for the others. So these are not amounts we would ignore, but they're honestly amounts you would get from a healthy meal. And they're amounts you would get many fold from just a normal, healthy, good multivitamin. So good to be aware of that, but that's not a barrier to treatment. That's not a reason someone would not take mercury out. You know, you're better off to lose a half a milligram of zinc and lose a whole bunch of mercury. You can easily get the zinc back, but it's tough to get that mercury out otherwise. A few other pitfalls are really just about how someone's going about life during treatment. Big thing is avoiding alcohol. Uh, next step is caffeine. So the two of those really change how your liver's working. And when you're not on those, you can detox much more smoothly with a lot less drama. Good hydration, regular bowel movements also make a big difference. And at integrative health, we also encourage the use of certain micronutrients, certain antioxidants and botanical medications. These have been clinically shown just to reduce any nuisance side effects, things like nausea, headaches, or rashes. By gentle dosing and by helpful cofactors, those things don't have to be big barriers. So the beautiful thing is that, yes, these kinds of toxins can really hurt your health, but they can be measured. We can identify them and see if they're there or not. If they are there, they can be gently coaxed out. They can be taken out of your body. And whenever your body doesn't work right, there's a reason for that. You know, these metals work at the most base chemical functions. So mood gets better, energy picks up, muscle cramps become a thing of the past, digestive function improves, thyroid antibodies come down. I've, I've been through this personally and seen just the big shift that occurs from getting rid of mercury. And we've seen scores of people have radical health improvements in those ways and many others. So Dr. C here, as always, don't think you're stuck with a bad lot with your symptoms. Things can change and they can change safely. We'll talk with you really soon.